Good morning. We hope that all are doing well as we assemble at this time in this way, to this degree, to have this sermon. And in the process, we'll be studying the Word of God. And we hope that it will benefit you in doing those things that we all must do to be saved and to live righteous lives. Today is a we're going to engage a very fundamental study that is essential and without which there's just simply not going to be any uh, salvation for anybody. And yet it's one of the most misunderstood doctrine set out in the scriptures. And I'm simply talking about uh, your faith in God. It matters what you believe. Your faith in God, it matters what you believe. That's going to be our subject for today. Have you ever had anybody ask you the question, does it matter what we believe? And I think we all have. The denominational world has long said it really doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you're sincere. I even asked the question to them, if they're going to take that particular view, then why do you need to be sincere? If it doesn't make any difference what you believe, because you may not believe you need to be sincere. So that's just a dodge around really what the Bible teaches about uh, saving faith. We're going to point out these three reasons, and there could be, of course, others, that it matters what we believe. And this is the case because, number one, our beliefs determine our actions. Number two, our actions are either followed by consequences if they're wrong actions or blessings if they're right actions. And number three, happiness results from believing the right things. So this is how we're going to approach this particular study of your faith in God. It matters what you believe. Our actions or our beliefs determine our actions. Our actions have either consequences if our beliefs are wrong, or they have blessings if our beliefs are right, and happiness results from believing the right things. And we're concerned about believing the right things, about believing correctly, and understanding how not believing correctly is detrimental to our spiritual welfare. Now, you remember very well Romans chapter 10, verse 17, where Paul is speaking, saying that so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you were to ask somebody, why is that the case? Could they tell us why faith comes by hearing the word of God? Certainly, faith comes by hearing the word of God because the word of God reveals to us the evidence necessary to believing in Jesus Christ of Nazareth as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. The gospel is God's power to save. Gospel means good news, Romans 1.16. The good news is in words written so we can understand it if we want to. And so we're taught to read. Paul said, when you read what I wrote, you'll understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Now, if we don't study, then we're not going to know. That's just true of any particular topic. And it's true of this topic concerning Christianity and specifically faith as it relates to serving God. So we're concerned about believing right things and turning away from wrong things because our actions flow from what we believe. Now, also we want to notice that we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Well, once we have the right faith, then we want to live by it. We don't live our lives according to how we see things through the five senses. We live our lives on the basis of what God said. That's the purpose of the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And James says as much in a different way in James chapter 1, verse 25. Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
Then we look to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. And in Hebrews 11, we have several men of the Old Testament, several people of the Old Testament, given as examples of what it is to believe the right thing and how that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, we've not been having uh, any public Bible reading, so let's just read Hebrews 11, 1 through 10. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And we see also that verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being yet dead, or being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him are the same promise. And then the last verse of this part of our text. For he, that is Abraham, looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. As a passing note, you will see that Abraham's life, according to verse 9, overlapped the eyes, the lives of Isaac and Jacob. Sometimes we don't think about that, but that's exactly what happened. Now, in Hebrews 11, we're seeing some wonderful, faithful conduct of people who never lived in the New Testament. Yet we have so much in the way of better things under the authority of Christ in the New Testament. The idea of the writer of the Hebrews epistle was if they served God so faithfully, if they kept his word so well under the patriarchy and under the law of Moses, how much more should we keep the will of Jesus in the New Testament? We have so much that they never had. And yet their lives serve as examples for our faithful service to God. Remember, whether it's patriarchy or whether it's the Mosaical Age or the Christian Age, faith always comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Always has. It's not just a matter of saying, well, I believe this. And by the way, belief is just the, the word believe is just the verb form of, of uh, what faith is the noun form of. So you're talking about the same thing. But you will notice that these people all lived as the word of God directed them. It's not enough to just say, well, I believe thus and so about God. If you can't find the teaching of what you believe in the Bible. You don't have any business believing it. It's, it could very well be a wrong belief. That doesn't mean you couldn't uh, arrive at a proper belief and do it without maybe knowing the Bible thought it, but it wouldn't be because you got it from the Bible, God's word, Him, and accepting His word as it is, true to the word of God, it would be that you stumbled across something like that. But you're not going to accidentally go to heaven. You're not going to accidentally, in the study of the Bible, 
handle it right or right and divide the word of truth. Your faith to be proper and correct must be formed by the proper study of the Bible and the right division of the word of God. You must have a right attitude toward God and his word. You must know why his word is put on this earth. And Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, as we are taught by Paul also, that we must study it and in studying it, rightly divide it in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. The point I want to make here is the simplest definition of faith is taking God at his word. We might add to that taking God at his rightly divided word. All these people we just read of in Hebrews chapter 11 took God at his word. And they realized that their faith had to be an obedient faith. It's evident in every example the Holy Spirit selected and placed in Hebrews chapter 11. James deals specifically with that, which, of course, James is just the next book after Hebrews. In chapter 2, when he points out that faith apart from works is dead. All these people in Hebrews 11 did not have a dead faith. Their faith was a living, active, obedient faith. But we're interested in making sure that we believe correctly because if our actions are to be correct, our beliefs must be correct. And that's made clear as to the importance of faith in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We want to emphasize what these great people of faith who lived under the patriarchal dispensation and the mosaical dispensation believed regarding the will of heaven for their lives at the time they were on the earth. We want to see how their belief was formed, how it was strengthened, how it was sustained, and thus what their faith moved them to do. Their actions were in harmony with what they believed. Now, of course, in today's religious world, there are many who say it doesn't matter what you believe, as I said earlier. And many are even in, inconsistent in that regard. Thus, they will firmly proclaim that it does not matter what one believes, as I said earlier. And by the way, their conduct reflects that view. Well, that's one thing to have that kind of action among human churches that are not founded on the truth of God and don't pretend to be the one church. But it's another thing to find that in the Lord's church among those who wear the name of Christ. Sometimes I hear brethren say, well, I believe this. Well, if you were to ask them, where in the Bible do you find that teaching? And they sort of look at you like the deer caught in the headlights. They don't know. Because what they're really saying is, I think this. And if I think this in service to God, then God accepts it. He never has. Jesus said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. Our beliefs will determine our actions. Now that doesn't mean that you can believe the truth and because you simply believe the truth, you're always going to act right. The Bible has a lot to say about hypocrites. The Bible has a lot to say about dead faith, such as in James chapter 2. So one can know what the Bible says. One can know that the Bible is the word of God. One can know that God says, I ought to believe this, that, or the other, and then not carry it out in their lives. Even teach the truth, but not practice it. Hebrews 11 and 4 says that Abel acted according to his beliefs, and his beliefs were based upon what God told him to do. Faith came by hearing the word of God for Abel. In Hebrews 11, 7, Noah acted according to his beliefs. Go back and read Genesis chapter 6, and see how Noah found grace in God's sight, verse 8. Then, being in favor with God, God gave him the plan of salvation from the flood. And verse 22 says, plainly, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. His faith was living and active. He acted according to his beliefs. His beliefs are right because he acted as God directed him. If you look at Matthew 12, 34, you'll see that one must have the right attitude of the inward man, the heart, because Christ said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
Then in Proverbs 4, verse 23, being that we are free moral agents, we have power over ourselves to do or not do this, that, or the other, or even to think this, that, or the other. He says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. If we believe the right things, we will act correctly. When we act upon those things that we believe that are right. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 35, Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. It's certainly a fact that if you believe evil things, things contrary to God's will, uh, then you're going to act according to what you believe, and it can't be right action. In Matthew 6, 22, Jesus said, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. This carries with it the idea that a one who is of Christ, a true Christian, as it, that term is defined and used in the New Testament, a member of the Lord's church, having believed in Christ on the basis of the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, repented of our sins, Acts 17, 30, confessed our faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10, and been baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, Galatians 3, 27, Acts 2, 38, the Lord adding us to His church when we do so, Acts 2, 47, then we are walking in the light as he is in the light. The light of what? The light of his word. That's how you're faithful. That's how you walk, by faith and not by sight. So if we believe the wrong things and we act upon what we believe, we cannot help but act incorrectly or wrongly. Again, we go to the Bible. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35, and the last part, of verse 35, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. If a person thinks contrary to the way God says he ought to think, and he acts upon those things, his acts are evil. Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 19 but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil faults, and then he specifies some of them, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Now, if you think on those things, you're going to be what you think. Different beliefs determine different actions. Some beliefs determine what we're going to trust or who we're going to trust. So who or what we trust determines our beliefs. We want to trust what or who is trustworthy, worthy of our trust. That's another way of saying worthy of our faith and confidence in him or whatever the thing may be. An example of trusting a thing is how much do you trust the brakes on your car to work what and do what they're supposed to do when you need them to stop you? Well, we use them with great faith that they're working correctly, and we know it pretty well readily when they don't. If you consider the beliefs of such things as witchcraft, sorcery, astrology, idolatry, secular humanism, materialism, atheism, and so on, then these will replace God and his word in your life and thus replace your source of trust and confidence. Some beliefs, of course, determine how we worship. If we worship correctly, as the Word of God rightly the Bible teaches, then we know God is well pleased. If incorrectly, we will offer vain or empty or worthless worship. Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees and others on that line and said so in Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 9. I bid in vain, pointless. I bid in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. 
all the way back to the beginning, we see this. Look at Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. They received instruction from God how God wanted to be worshipped. Now there's the word, and faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Abel acted based upon what he believed, which was what God said. Cain did not. And the attitude of wicked Cain toward righteous Abel has always, to one extent or the other, been the same down to this present day and will be to the end of time. Whether they're hypocrites and unfaithful in the church or whether they're people outside the church, their attitude when they want to justify themselves and their sins toward those who teach the truth, contend for it, and live it, and advocate that others must do the same thing to be saved, their attitude toward them is going to be just like Cain's or like the Pharisees and the chief priests, the scribes, Sadducees concerning Jesus. Some beliefs determine how we personally behave. Personal behavior is certainly important to an orderly society. Offensive behavior can only create disorder and confusion. Now, look at the time in which we're living. Look at what happened just a few days ago. People acted according to the way they thought. And so they had big fights over toilet paper. Now, that shows you how fickle and foolish people are, but it also shows you how self-willed and determined to have whatever it is they seek to possess to somebody else in the process of their possessing it. They're selfish and they're self-willed. If you become a Christian and truly converted to the gospel of Christ, you don't act that way because you don't believe that way. And of course, when you read Paul's teaching on agape love in 1 Corinthians 13, we're taught plainly that we're not to behave wrongly or inappropriately. You'll find from 1 Corinthians 13, 5, that love does not behave itself unseemly in a wrong fashion. One reason is because love always submits to the truth and seeks the truth, and that truth is found in God's Word. Jesus said, if you continue in my Word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 31 and 32. And he prayed, Father, sanctify them, set them apart, meet, suitable for the Master's service. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. And, of course, we're to preach the Word. And when we do, we're preaching the truth of Christ. We're preaching the very source of faith. We're teaching right thinking so people's actions will be right actions. So if it's important how we act, it's even more important what we believe. Then we need to know, as so many in our land today don't seem to get, that our choices, since we're free moral agents, we can make choices, and we do. Our choices or our actions have either blessings because we love and obey the truth or consequences because we act contrary to the truth of God's Word. We act based upon what we believe. So then blessings or consequences follow from our actions. Galatians 6 and verse 7, Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia, to every one of us who named the name of Christ, the members of the church, that we have a responsibility. And here it is. Be not deceived. Don't believe a lie. Think it's the truth. God's given us the power to know the difference in right and wrong and to understand by studying the Bible that we can learn the right and anything contrary to it must be wrong. But he says, be not deceived. I have that obligation to myself. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. The law of reaping and sowing. You sow turnip green seeds, you're going to get turnip green. If you didn't want turnip greens, don't sow turnip green seeds. If you want to raise pinto beans, then you have to get pinto seeds. If you plant pinto beans expecting to get purple peas, you're going to be sadly disappointed. We do not live in a vacuum. 
in the world where we are in the flesh, but we are not of the world. 1 Corinthians 5.10. What does that mean? It means we think according to the word of God. We act according to what we think. We don't live on the plane of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride or vainglory of life. John deals with that a lot in 1 John. Trying to train members of the church converted to Christ by the gospel how they ought to think so that their actions will be right. And they don't think like the world thinks. If they do, they're unfaithful. And the consequences or the blessings in our lives, I think primarily the consequences now, the consequences of believing the wrong thing and acting the wrong way affect the lives of other people. There has been, since this uh, COVID-19 virus has been out, this great pandemic on the Facebook social media, a picture of a whole line of matches close enough together that when one ignites, it ignites the next one, and it ignites the following one, and so on down the line. But then, making a point, one match is removed. Thus, when the last match ignites, there's a gap far enough apart to where the next match doesn't. As I said, consequences affect the lives of others. We must understand what the world readily understands, and they may be as ignorant as a stump when it comes to what the Bible says, but they see it. But my brethren sometimes who claim to be the children of light don't seem to see these things. I don't know why, but I know the Lord dealt with it. And yet we above all people ought to see what the truth is and the difference in truth and error and then make the choice to act on the truth we believe. Every action, good or bad, in which we engage, there is then a ripple effect in the world. Psalm 119 and verse 11 Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Remembering that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. In Psalm 119, verse 9, the psalmist wrote, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And then he answers, By taking heed thereto according to thy word. If you don't know the Bible, you'll be destroyed. That happened to Israel of old. Hosea makes it plain. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. See, their faith can't be right if their knowledge of God's word is not right. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to understand that we need to be reminded that happiness results from believing the right thing. Now, this is a happiness that says, all is well with me and God. You can have the whole world falling down around you, but when you know you're right with your God because you believe the truth and live according to it, then you never expected to live on this earth forever anyway. Jesus taught that those who believe the right things are the ones who have true joy. John 15, verse 11, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is not some sort of giddiness. This is a settled joy that comes from knowing you're reconciled to God because your sins are forgiven and you're justified in his sight and you're living in harmony with his will. You're thinking right. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. That means think about those things in God's Word and not those things that pertain to this life. We have joy from knowing the right way to live. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 28, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Correct belief brings us hope. 
hope is that expectation of what a faithful child of God has a right to expect. Yet it's coupled with this earnest desire to receive what we have a right to expect. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. When the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6 and verse 17, leads and guides and directs your thoughts, then your actions are going to be right. That's the reason we're taught to bring ourselves in subjection to God's will. Correct belief brings us to joy regarding our own salvation, our own being forgiven of our sins. In 1 Peter 1 verse 8, the apostle said, Whom having not seen, speaking of God and Christ, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. When you know the word of God, that it is in truth the word of God, when it's rightly divided, when you earnestly hunger and thirst after God's word, with the determination to obey his will for your life, then you'll always see things the way nobody else sees them. Sometime do a study on how the Lord talks about seeing. He talks about people seeing and yet seeing not. And then he'll talk about blessed are your eyes for they see. Well, of course, the fleshly eyeball and the optic nerve connected to the brain helps us see the material things. So that's taken and used to talk about mindful sight and so we can see things because we believe in god and follow his word that those without the knowledge of god's word doesn't understand they don't see they're blind and cannot see afar off and that's one reason the christian has that which the world knows not of when he lives in harmony with the word of god correct belief then brings joy to others as well as ourselves in 3 John 1, which is really one chapter, verse 4, John says this, and it should be true of every faithful child of God, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Well, why is that the case? Because it means they love the Lord. Thus, they love his word. Thus, they're thinking on his word, and they're acting in harmony with it, because that's the only way you can walk in truth. As we bring the lesson to a close, I simply refer you to the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. There he begins what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. Beatitude means a beautiful attitude, a beautiful mindset. And frankly, there's not found among people many of these attitudes. He says, blessed are you or happy are you. Well, when? when we believe the truth and we live our lives based upon it, when we can rejoice that our actions will have the consequences or blessings, I should say here, because we live according to the truth, consequences follow bad actions. So when we have the blessings that God intended for us and not the consequences that are evil or wicked because we live according to what is wicked and evil. So what a great lesson. And what a great reason to rejoice. Now, what have we done today? Well, we've tried to emphasize the importance of what we believe. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and what that means. And used examples from Hebrews 11, patterns of life of people who never knew the gospel of Christ, but they faithfully served God under the law they had, whether it was the patriarchal dispensation of the Mosaic age. And we see that that faith was always an obedient faith and that it was a faith that took God at his word. It didn't just say, well, I believe this and mean, well, I think this. But when you go to the Bible, you can't find any reason to think that and think that God accepts it. So our actions are based upon our beliefs. We want to have right beliefs. The blessings or consequences follow from our actions. In other words, if we believe wrong, our actions will be wrong if we act in concert with it. If we believe right, then our actions will be right when we act in concert with that. 
but our actions will flow from our beliefs. And then the last thing is the happiness, true, genuine happiness, contentment and peace results from believing the right things. Now that's what will get you through such times as we're presently undergoing or any other time. I suggest if you know history, people have been through a whole lot worse times than we're going through now. But whatever we're going through, whatever phase of life we're in, it doesn't change the fact that faith comes by hearing the Word of God and that a saving faith is an obedient faith and that without faith it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 5 and verse 9 makes it clear that the faith that saves is the faith that obeys, always has been. And the faith that does not obey is a dead faith. And we don't want a dead faith. Because that means a dead mind. Because it's believing contrary to the truth of God's word that creates proper faith. Of course, to become a Christian, it's more than faith only. That should be seen in Hebrews 11. Their faith moves them to act upon what God told them to do. And under the gospel dispensation, the gospel is the power of God to save, Romans 1.16. Through it and it alone are people saved by Jesus Christ. And it requires people to believe in him. We've studied how that belief comes. And it must be a belief that will take the rest of God's word concerning the terms of salvation from sin, repent of one's sins, Acts 17, 30, confess one's faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10 and verse 10, complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized by the authority of Christ, for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38, Galatians 3, 27. The Lord adds you to his church when you do that, and in that church you walk by faith and not by sight. So be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life, Revelation 2, 10. So if you need to obey the gospel, let us know. If as a child of God you've been unfaithful, would you honestly accept that fact? There's a second law of pardon. It requires you to repent of those sins to confess them and to pray God for forgiveness. God will be true to his word, and we must accept him on the basis of his word. Remember, faith is taking God at his rightly divided word, and the faith that saves acts upon that word in obedience to the gospel. So if you need to obey the truth, please let us know. We thank you for being with us. Hope these words will encourage and strengthen and cause us all to walk straight and narrow way that ends in heaven. And we bid you, Good day.